are listening to Toolbox of the Trades, brought to you by Service Titan, a podcast for top service professionals where we interview leaders for their best tips and tricks of the trades. Learn how industry trailblazers stay ahead of the competition and how you too can be at the forefront of an industry. Let's jump in. Megan Bedford, welcome to the Toolbox for the Trades. Thank you, Jackie. I'm happy to be here. I am so excited to chat with you. You are the owner of MacGyver Consulting and the founder of Desk Free Nation, two fantastic organizations. Well, Desk Free Nation is all about getting more folks into the trades. MacGyver Consulting is a wonderful firm where you help folks in the trades with marketing. I cannot wait to talk to you about this. You have a ton of experience in both sales and marketing, but I'm going to kick off this interview the way I do all of my interviews, which is just ask you, how did you get into the trades? So I come from a family of two entrepreneurs and I had a feeling I'd become an entrepreneur later in my life, but I started my career in Yellow Pages of all things for Yellow Book. And I was schlepping Yellow Pages out of King of Prussia was their headquarters. So I started going literally door to door with Yellow Pages in a sales career at 22. And the crazy thing about that is you have to know about every kind of business, right? Not only do you have to have the courage to walk in the door, but you have to, you, there's no business that you're not calling on. So if you were to pick up a yellow page directory back in the day, you'd see like plumbers, HVAC, electrical, and attorneys take up like the majority of a yellow page directory. So that's how I originally got kind of interested in the trades and, and really got to understand those guys. I mean, you have to call on them you know, six, seven books a year. So you get to know these guys really well. And they spend, they spent a lot of money. That's then the only places to advertise were Yellow Pages newspaper and maybe some radio. So nice. So in that sales career, you just got really familiar with these industries that I'm imagining you had no experience with prior to, right? No, I didn't. I know this is, um, asking about, you know, the start of your career, my start, the start of my career is so fuzzy. Like, don't ask me, don't ask me anything that happened before like 2018, but do you remember anything that really surprised you when you spoke with plumbing, HVAC and electrical people, when you were first in your career, like, were there any, you know, stereotypes that were kind of just thrown out the window once you got to yeah. know these men and women? Absolutely. I, and back then I would say the majority of the owners were men. And now you see a lot more women in the industry, which I really appreciate. But, you know, you make this assumption, my dad owned trash companies. So I, I knew not to have like a stereotype of what business owners were like in, in the trades or plumbing industry. What I found is a lot of these men and that I met were just really intelligent, really good business owners, great at systems. Some of them were plumbers and some of them weren't. So it really, I get to really understand not only their business, but also just these people. They're just really good business people is what I found out. And so, yeah, the stereotype went away very quickly if there was any. Yeah. That was really cool. That's awesome. And I imagine also coming from an entrepreneurial background, you were very quickly able to see like, oh, that person kind of reminds me of my dad. Oh, that like, I wonder, I wonder if it was like kind of easy for you to make the connections. Cause that was my biggest aha moment working at service Titan was like, holy cow, these are some of the most successful business people I've ever met in my life. Yeah. I think for me also just having some empathy for what they were juggling, you know, so business owners, any business owner, but business owners in the trades, I mean, they're, they're juggling everything and they've got all these trucks out and they're trying to keep track of all the techs and the phone calls being answered and then booking the job and then marketing and all the things, right. And accounting. So just having a lot of compassion, like I'm not their biggest priority being this yellow page salesperson walking in and they've got a lot of things they're juggling right now. And so understand that. Got yeah. it. I'm also yeah. so happy that you shared that you had a yellow pages background because we're going <laughs> to dig into marketing and oh that's like God. everyone's favorite. It's, I, it's a phrase I hear a lot, which is like the yellow pages don't work anymore, but then you actually speak to some owners and the yellow pages still work for them. Yeah. But before we even get into that, I would love to hear a little bit more about where you went after the yellow pages and at MacGyver, you know, where you're the owner and the founder, I believe as well, yeah. you intentionally chose to make plumbing, HVAC, contracting, electrical businesses your niche. And I would love to learn, as you came up from the Yellow Pages, you eventually worked at Scorpion. What kind of prompted you to really say, yep, this is the industry that I'm going to work with? 
Yeah. So the end of my career, I left Haibu in 2010. I was running the Denver Boulder office and I was just, I could see everything was moving towards digital and we weren't keeping up fast enough. So I actually started a digital agency in Denver, localize it. And by happenstance, we, we formed a relationship with some franchise companies and niched out that way, but then with Nexstar as well. So mm-hmm. Nexstar was a big partnership of ours. I then merged my company with a company in New York, Driven Local, and we actually sold that company in 2017 to Scorpion. So Scorpion, you know, when, when I joined Scorpion, we were, my partner Rodney and I were head of the Nexstar relationship for Scorpion. So we were, I was really only talking to anybody that was a Nexstar member and plumbing, HVAC, and electrical. That was really all I talked about all day long. And so during that time with Scorpion, I was really able to meet some incredible owners and really understand the industry even that much more, which brought me to my consulting company. So got it. that's kind of how yeah. I paved the path. And it wasn't, you know, if I can look back and say the thing that I love the most about the trades is it's recession proof. And it always has been. Meaning even if the economy collapses and we're going through a recession, what I found is this industry doesn't feel it as much because if your faucet's leaking or your water heater breaks, you're going to have to fix it. So for me, it's always been also this very safe industry to be aligned with as far as, you know, monetarily. So that's been a really good choice for me as well. Not a good choice for you, good choice for everyone who's working there right now. I mean, we also learned, I think, this past year that not only is it recession proof, it's also pandemic proof. Yes. Um, which, I mean, ev- good on everyone listening who has chosen this these industries to work in because, yeah, I mean, as someone who's worked in tech my entire career, it's very wonderful working for a company that provides tech to essential services. Yeah, so you have experience in marketing, which we're going to get into quickly, but you also have experience in sales, which I think is really fun. Um, <laughs> and there's this, there's this stereo, there's this, uh, this belief that sales and marketers don't get along, which, uh, I've seen in my career. I'm sure you've seen in yours. And I think in the PHCE space, so plumbing, HVAC, contracting, electrical, it may mean that like a marketer or CSR, but butts heads with a selling tech or a comfort advisor. Do you find that to be true? And if so, how do you recommend improving that relationship? You know, if you see it, I think it's basically a breakdown of communication, mostly meaning the CSR is answering the phone and they're stating a certain set of things. And then when you're in front of a customer, you might say some different things too. And being in sales myself, my whole life, I think that can happen. You know, I'll be in front of a customer and I'm, you know, of course I want to give them what they need. And then I'll go back to the team and be like, we got to make this happen. And so I think that's where the friction can lie, but I don't think it's ever intentional. I think at the end of the day, we're all trying to do what's best for the customer, but where it gets kind of tricky is with communication or lack of communication. So just being really clear on this is, I was in front of the customer. This is what came up. And this is what I said we could do. And, and everyone at the end of the day, if we're all on the same team of kind of helping that customer and meet their needs, then that's really what the solution is. It shouldn't be be about like, Oh, well, this is the rule. And I said this, it should be about providing the best service to that customer. Got it. So at MacGyver, you work with, you know, a bunch of different clients and different companies as you roll out different marketing campaigns and initiatives with them. What kind of advice do you give owners or your point of contacts to make sure that everyone is on the same page? Well, first is defining clearly what the goal here is, right? So what is kind of your go-to market strategy? What are the things that you stand behind for a customer? Is there any flexibility in dispatch fees? Is there any flexibility in... um, pricing and discounts. So it's it's really becoming very clear on what the offering is, what are the goals, and then making sure everybody's on the same page. Many times in marketing meetings now, I don't want to just talk to the owner. I want to talk about who's handling the phone. So who heads up like all the people that are answering the phones. I have the service tech manager on our calls because we're a team. We're not, it's not one person and then communicating down. I want it to be this clear communication so that 
we're all on the same page. And I think the really cool thing is that that service tech manager is going to have a different experience with customers than the owner is. And the people answering the phones are going to have also a different experience on what they're seeing or why they're not booking calls. And each, each one of those departments forms together to kind of this whole success of not only the marketing program, but then also the success of the company overall. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. This is actually a theme that's come up quite a bit in recent interviews where companies will be running some sort of promo or they'll be doing a specific type of campaign and then a customer calls and they mention the promo on the phone and the CSR goes, I don't know what you're talking about. Like nothing's, I think, a worse look than that. Would you agree? I agree. And that's, you know, when there's an email marketing campaigns that are about to go out, those get communicated directly to that team. So they know, because that's horrible. You answer the phone, you don't know what the customer's talking about. So everything has to be communicated very clearly. And I think if you can all be a part of one team with that communication, that kind of solves it. Yeah, it's definitely a hard, hard needle to thread, I think. You know, I think when we talk about communicating amongst all members of the team, especially as the organization gets bigger and bigger and bigger, if you choose to make that organization bigger, it sometimes just gets really hard to communicate. It does. It really does. And I'm I, I may be inflecting a bit of my own uh my own experience here in this in this particular conversation. But I think it's really imperative that especially when it comes to marketing campaigns, owners take that time to make sure that, that service managers and office managers have all of the information that they need. They do. And I and I recommend if you're having a marketing meeting, I run mine weekly with customers, but if you're having a marketing meeting, get the people involved that are impacting your business. The person that manages all the CSRs and the service tech manager, those are the people that have eyes on other parts of the business and giving them a voice, not only as empowerment, but it makes them feel part of the team and part of the solution. And and it really adds to the overall success of the business, I think. Yeah, I agree. I think the more open with communication you are on your team, the more buy-in you get from them and the more invested they are in their its success opposed to owning or managing within a silo and kind of hoarding information. Totally. I agree. I love that. So another kind of pie in the sky question I had for you, I really was, when I was preparing for this interview, I was like, you've worked with so many people and I just have so many observations I've made over dozens of interviews I've done, probably hundreds at this point, honestly, but marketing is one of those many functions that service owners or their second in command own as a business is scaling. It's like, Oh, you're the owner of a plumbing business. What do you do? I do everything. (laughs) What advice would you give for folks who are juggling marketing operations along with a dozen other high value tasks? Yeah. And that's totally normal. And I think as you're going, even, even the large companies, they're juggling so many things. You're never going to own one part of your business, you're going to be involved in so many aspects. So the first bit of advice I have is align with people you trust. And if you at a point of growth where you can't, you don't have a budget yet for a marketing person in-house, then take the time to interview your vendors and take the time to understand what those vendors are offering. Do they work in the trades or are they, is their specialty something else? Because My biggest advice is make sure somebody that has experience in the trades for marketing, for sure. It's a different animal. So those vendors, vet those vendors. Is there transparency with those vendors? Do you have to micromanage them? If you're constantly trying to call, you know, feel like you have to call them and micromanage them, that's not a good relationship and not a good use of your time. So taking that time up front to align with people that not only you trust, but that are results driven are going to make it so you can go off and do other things. If you don't feel like you can make that decision, like you don't even have enough information to make that decision, then hire somebody that can help you choose those vendors that does understand it. Because you see this all the time. You see people will invest in a new website, a year of their time changing vendors. They've spent thousands and thousands of dollars and the ROI wasn't there. And then a year later, they're in the same position where they have to do it all over again time is money. That's your time wasted. That's, you know, leads you're missing out on. And that time you take up front to make these decisions is really important. 
Yeah, I definitely agree. And I also agree with the point you made about not having a vendor that you have to chase down, <laughs> making sure that you choose a vendor who is you're setting the expectations of this is how I want to be communicated with. This is how I want to work with you. This is what I expect. Because nothing feels worse than paying a vendor thousands and thousands of dollars and you have to send them emails like, hey, how's my marketing doing? Right, right. So let's talk marketing. Let's let, we finally, I've, I've asked for advice. Let's, let's actually like dig into the nitty gritty. And we've actually spoken before. We did a wonderful webinar about a year ago, all on email marketing. Cause you, you were one of the early adopters of email marketing pro, which is our email marketing solution at service Titan. I would just love to hear, you know, we've mentioned the trades are such a niche and specific industry. How do you approach marketing for the trades and what are some of your like one of some of your soapboxes, so to speak. Yeah. So how I approach it first is big picture. So I love to like you find out about business owners and what are their goals and, you know, because to, to just throw a dart, this is what I'm doing for marketing. And well, why, you know, what are you trying to get out of your marketing first? And then what I find is a lot of business owners in the trades don't really have the details of their marketing. So first I like to look at big picture goals and then match it with where are the holes? You know, where are the holes are, how is your website converting? I always put myself in one of their customer shoes. So I pretend I'm a customer and I start looking in all different ways to find a plumber or an electrician or HVAC contractor in their area. And, and then I find, are they even showing up? you know, where are the holes? And then when I land on their website, what experience does that have for me? Do, am I, are they answering questions that I have? Am I able to find them in other places? How is their reputation? So first it's just kind of taking this big picture view of, okay, who is this company? What are their goals? And then where are their holes? Like, where are they not showing up and how do they perceive themselves? And then how do I perceive them as, as a potential customer? So that's first. And then Really, how I look at it too is there's certain systems that have to be in place for a business. You can go spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on marketing, but if you're not converting those in house to book jobs, what's the point? Right? So, how is their internal system? And I think this is a big mistake marketing companies make, digital marketing companies, is that we don't take enough time to look at some of those internal systems. And I would say, being a consultant has allowed me to really get underneath the business. Whereas when I was in digital marketing, I would just pay attention to lead gen and how the website was converting. So it was a very like, it was a good approach, but it wasn't at the end of the day, if those internal systems are broken, it doesn't matter how much you're spending on advertising. It's just like, if your website is not converting into leads why are you spending any money right now until you fix those issues with your website? Does that make sense? Um, 100%. So I really like to see like, okay, what is your booking rate? And many times too, when you go on service site and dashboard, you're going to see, well, a company might have 85%, but is that data really right? You know, are they actually, and I don't mean service Titans, not right. I mean, are the CSRs actually being accurate? Are those jobs actually getting booked? So getting underneath kind of booking rate and how well are we doing as a team with cancellations and booking rate first? And then as you're, okay, so that system's not broken. Okay, so that we can put a check mark, those systems are fixed. All right, so website, how does our website convert when we run pay-per-click or Google LSAs or Google My Business? When people land on that site, are they picking up the phone or are they getting on there and then backing out and calling a competitor? You know, mm -hmm. what are your click through rates with your ads? You know, are your ads producing phone calls or are people just clicking on them? So there's a lot of things that you want to look at first and fix before you start putting a lot of investment into your marketing. And that's what I like to pay attention to. I mean, those are where the details are. And if you don't fix those issues first, it really doesn't matter who you hire as a vendor or how your marketing's working or how much you're spending because you're not going to get the results you want. And then Got your it. expectation is going to be up here. And we didn't have a conversation because it's we're not really talking the same language, if that makes sense. No, it 100% makes sense. And I'm glad you put it into contrast. You know, when I was working in-house, 
at a different company, I was focused on lead gen, but as a consultant, you now have the ability to get a real holistic view of how the business is running because your success is dependent on these leads converting. I really would love to learn more about an example, if you have one, not to put you on the spot, of some internal systems that you've had to see be tweaked, especially as it pertains to booking rate or, yeah, just booking the job. Yeah, this one client I have, there wasn't a CSR manager in place. He was kind of, the owner was taking on that role. And when I looked at the numbers last year, we are at an 85% booking rate, really strong in the trades. And so I didn't dig into it. I was going by the data and I could see the legion and the numbers looked good. I mean, most businesses during the year of COVID had a great year. So digging into those details didn't seem as needed. Hired a CS manager, CSR manager. She got tons of experience. I mean, she's amazing. She really got into the details and... Um, what we found is the booking rate was actually like 67%. Okay. And a lot of that was things were showing just not filling out the data correctly and not putting the data that's all there and all available, but the CSRs weren't being trained to do it the right way. So that's a huge discrepancy. I mean, almost 20% discrepancy. So getting underneath those numbers and really making tweaks. And what we found is like, a phone call would come in and let's say like this is a market with, you know, winters and snow. So busy snowstorm, what you're going to find is, oh, well, we can't get to you for two weeks or, you know, we're booked out two weeks. So they'll just say, you know, they'd give up versus like digging into it. Hey, listen, everybody's really busy. We're triaging our calls. So have, like taking the time to slow down and have that conversation and say everybody's in the same boat we're going to get to you. Here's when we can get to you and we'll communicate if anything else comes up sooner. So what we found is so many of the CSRs were actually just quickly, quickly saying um, they didn't want to have that conversation. And, and that's what you see yeah. sometimes is if you don't get into the details, you don't understand that we could take a step back and have a, have a conversation with a customer and then save that and, and book the lead. You know, and um, what I find is that when you're able to communicate, like when we're able to have open communication, so I've been able to tell the CSR team now, hey guys, leads are expensive. It, this is how much work we go in to get a lead. And this is how important it is to actually convert that lead into a job. So if we can take the time to actually have a conversation and book that call, no matter what, you know, that's going to be worth it because when you're spending a hundred dollars a lead, every lead matters. It matters a lot. A hundred percent. Thank you for giving that explanation. I mean, what I really heard there too was owner who was taking on the CSR manager role because they had to in that moment. And as a result, stuff was getting kind of lost in the, in the cracks. I'm really happy to hear that your client got that CSR manager who was able to dig in. That's, yeah, that's awesome. awesome. It's worth every penny. Um, Amazing. <laughs> She's worth every penny. Talk to me about website because I see a lot of discrepancies with website across the board in the industry. We have some folks that have really seemingly high production websites. We have others that are not as high production, kind of really simple and basic. What would you define as a good website? And if the answer is one that converts, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So there's two sides to websites, right? There's the conversion aspect, which is like the customer experience that they're having. And then you've got the SEO side, which is content and having lots of different pages to drive Google spiders to what those pages are about. So they actually show up. So your website actually has to have two goals there, right? And understanding that is very important. So yes, and websites have changed a lot. And you know, what really drives me nuts in this industry is that you have all of these different digital agencies and they want to charge between 10 and 20 grand for a website. And I'm sorry, that's like, it's almost like when you buy that car, it loses its value right when you drive it off the lot. Same with a website. Technology is changing. You have to update it. It gets slower. Mobile's change Now mobile usage is through the roof, you know? So does that really make sense? I mean, I know some plumbers that 
$20,000 every year on new websites because they'll get with a new digital agency and they'll say, oh, you have to, we'll only run PPC if you use our website, you know? So I can see where these guys are and gals are so frustrated. This is, websites are frustrating, you know, in the sense that why can't we just get this right? So advice, first, put yourself in your customer's shoes and start looking at what your competitors are saying. If your site's not converting well, why isn't it converting well? So I'm a customer and I'm looking for a plumber and I've got specific questions in my mind about what you do. Do you do same day? Do you have a dispatch fee? Will I get a quote over the phone or up front when you, know, when you come here? Are you 24 seven as emergency? Do you offer financing? There's all these questions that I, is your num- can I find your number? Are you one answering those questions? And if you're not, why aren't you not? Like I call, when you land on a website and it's called above the fold. So that's what you see on your screen. Many times what you see above the fold is like plumber, San Francisco. And it's like, then there's, and the phone number. It's like, why would I choose you? Why do you think you're so special that I'm going to pick up? Most of the time, it's an infrequent need that they don't have a plumber in mind. So are your reviews showing, you know, reputation's a huge part of it. Do you feel confident? You know, are you family owned or are you fly by night plumber? You know, so are you answering those questions? And then what are your competitors saying that you're not saying? So one is on the conversion rate and everybody should know their conversion rate. You should know how your PPC converts. You should know, and a good ballpark is, I'd like to see my sites at least converting at 30%. So that means 30% of the time when people land on my site, they're picking up the phone and calling me or filling out a form submission, right? If you're in 10%, there's gotta be a reason why and you gotta look into that. So the coolest thing about that is you can start to make small changes. If you're seeing you're at 10, maybe just make the phone number bigger and add a couple more things and see if that helps. Do little changes and see which help helps the conversion rate go up. So that's one. Conversion rates, everything. Because think about it, you're spending $10,000 in advertising and mm-hmm. your site's converting at 10%. Well, imagine if you increase that same $10,000 up to 30 or 40%, you just made a lot more money off your investment. So the website, paying attention to those details, super important. On the SEO side, biggest mistake I see is people don't take the time to separate out the pages. So someone told me long ago, think of Google as a kindergartner, okay? And the kindergartner needs the easiest path to find out information. So I'm a consumer and I'm looking for a plumber in San Francisco and I do that search, Well, if you have a page about plumbing in San Francisco on your site, you're going to have a better chance of being delivered. Now, let's say that same person searches hot water heater in San Francisco. If I have a page that doesn't just say water heater, but another page that's talking about hot water heaters, and there's content around it and title tags around it, and it's showing Google exact path to that page for what I searched, that's going to be a great match because I gave Google and didn't confuse the kindergartner. I made it very clear and my site got delivered. So there's two ways around it. And I think a lot of people, a lot of business owners don't understand that you're just trying to provide, like your website is also a very clear path to the search engines to deliver the cleanest information. If Google didn't have the information, clearly they would never deliver your site. So we're just making Google understand what we do the best way possible. Does that make sense? Try to make that simple. Yeah, it makes sense. yeah, it makes a lot of sense. You literally just spoke to someone who's been in marketing for years, has taken several SEO <laughs> courses. And in the phrase, think of Google like a kindergartner, you just cleared it up for me. So I'm sure you cleared it up for a lot of other people. And I was actually going to ask one more thing about SEO. I'm seeing more and more customers of ours implementing blogs on their site. Um, yeah. Is that also something that you recommend for a lot of your clients? Yeah. I mean, do we have a lot of customers out there that are reading, you know, plumbing blogs? Maybe not. But if you think about a blog, first of all, as not so much ranking, thinking about blogs and videos about, I want to provide information for customers, you know, free information. If, if a customer, you know, was thinking about 
installing a tankless water heater, well, do a blog on the benefits of a tankless water heater and tell the customers, not as a sales pitch to you, but as a benefit to that customer of what a tankless water heater and what that does to you for SEO is it provides fresh content on your site, which you didn't have before because you're not adding a ton of pages all the time. And it also, um, if you title it correctly and tag it correctly, it gives Google a clear path to some fresh content, um, you know, about tankless water heaters for you. So, you know, you don't want to keyword stuff and all those things, but if you're actually doing it for the benefit of your customer, it's a win-win for your business, for sure. I love that. All right. Let's talk email marketing too, because yeah. email marketing has definitely been is is one of your specialties in my opinion. And I would just love to talk to you about how you've leveraged it at your clients and also how you explain it to folks that are like, why would customers want to hear from me, their plumber or HVAC tech, like year right. round? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. So I love email marketing. It's still one of the best cost for leads that I can that is out there. And so one is you might be a smaller trade company that doesn't have salespeople and you might even have salespeople. Think of email marketing as a salesperson working for you all the time. And what I mean by that is one, you can make automated emails that follow up on, you know, your estimates that you give. So every time you give an estimate, you can have an email that goes out and says, Hey, thanks for giving us this opportunity. Here's all the reasons why we could be a great fit, or you could give them a discount to encourage them to take advantage of that estimate and book the appointment. So one is salesperson follow-up. It's also great communication. So what I find is a lot of these businesses, like an electrician, I think we use an electrician once every eight years. Okay. So you're an electrician. How are you going to ensure that customer chooses you eight years later when they need an electrician? They're probably not even going to remember you. But if they know that you've communicated through with them throughout the years with like your spring newsletter and all these different tips and tricks and all these things, they're going to know who you are because you just branded yourself to them for eight years through email marketing. So that's really cool. It's like staying relevant to somebody that was already your customer, right? And giving them information. And another thing is, it's a way to really niche out specific types of businesses. So like one of the things I'm running right now, and I'm constantly thinking of new ideas is thinking about like, you may have installed a furnace a year ago or a boiler a year ago. And so we do like a happy birthday to your furnace. And <laughs> oh, <I> love it. <laughs> it's basically just saying like, make sure you stay up with the warranties and your furnace is one. And then, you know, maybe when the furnace is three, you can give it to, it's just, you can make it fun and it's, it's inexpensive. I think we're, most of my campaigns are under $15 a lead. It's just a great way to communicate with your customers. Yeah, I think it is really fun. And I think if we go back to what you had just said about SEO, which is as long as you're providing valuable information and education to your customer, you really can't go wrong. Yeah. I would love to hear about what, in regards to newsletters, like what kind of content do you select to feature for your clients? Is it company stuff? Like we just added a new CSR manager. Is it, well, obviously you want to send an email if you open up to a new service, like, Hey, we were your plumber. Now we offer HVAC service. Obviously that's a, that's a no brainer, but like, what do you consider? What do you consider a value add that most people so like, would want so to see? Spring, let's say, cause it's right around the corner. I'll give some. Mm -hmm. So one is I like to do like a recipe, you know, something for the spring that's nothing to do with the businesses that I work with, but just like recipe. If there's some fun things going on in the area to tell people about spring break tips, if you're going on spring break, which I don't know how many people are this year, but if let's say you, it was a normal year and you were like things that you should do to your house to close it down for that week, you know, so with the thermostat, what you should keep it at, you know, all the different like HVAC and plumbing things. So some tips about the house, if, you know, some ideas for Mother's Day, if Mother's Day is coming up. So it's really, the newsletters are more educational and not, not salesy at all. It's more tips. I always think of like, what's in it for the customer to read this? What is in it? And that's how you constantly have to operate as a business owner, you can't just be out there selling things to people all the time. What's in it 
for my customers to take the time out of their day to op- not only open this email, but then to read some of the content. And so that's really what you have to drive forward is what's in it for them. Like we're doing, we have St. Patty's Day coming up and I think green and I think about all the energy efficiency things. If there's rebates with your um, electrical company or energy company in your local area or anything that could benefit the customer and on going green right now, like a lot of my customers will do uh, electric car outlets Mm -hmm. and things like that. So anything green is associated with that, but it's constantly thinking like, what's in it for them to read this? It's not about me. It's never about you. It's about Got it. (laughs) I'm actually, I'm like kind of semi resisting the urge to just brainstorm email campaigns for uh, (laughs) the trades right now. Cause I, I really could have a lot of fun with this. I want to talk before we go into desk free nation. I also wanted to ask you your opinion on personas. Cause the more I'm talking with folks in the trades, I mentioned this earlier, you know, some folks will say the yellow pages are dead, but then you'll speak to someone who's in a rural community who loves the yellow pages because their client, their client base, their persona is ages 55 and older. So when you're working with different clients, how much of the market do you assess before taking a client on? What would you recommend that other owners do as they're thinking about marketing and who they're speaking to? Yeah. So I have a spreadsheet that is like crazy and it, and it has every marketing that we do. So every bit of marketing that that client is doing. And then, you know, the great thing about service tightening is unlimited tracking lines. So assign a tracking line to everything. So I always say we have to act on fact versus speculation. You can walk into a business and they can say, oh yeah, the newspaper is working great. And so is my direct mail piece. And then, oh really, let me, can I see the results? And um, if you don't know how things are performing, then how can you make an educated decision? And yes, the assumption is yellow pages are dead, but you're exactly right. In rural Michigan, they work great. So, and people hold on to books from 10 years ago and they still have them in their house and still call off off those numbers. So first you have to find out what is my goal? Because if you're, if we're talking If you have a limited amount of budget, we want to focus mostly on lead gen and a lot of extra branding on radio and TV and other things aren't necessarily where you want to put your budget right now. You want leads. So you're going to focus on LSAs and your Google My Business and Yelp and pay-per-click and all and SEO and making sure that you're generating leads first. And then maybe branding comes more branding comes in later, like more newspaper, direct mail, all of those things. But the biggest thing I would say, if you don't have a system right now to understand how things are performing, try and not even try, please get that in place because how can you make educated decisions when you don't know what's working and what's not? And I will say this, is that branding, advertising, so I might run a radio campaign and a lot of people aren't going to pick up the phone and call you off a radio campaign. They're not going to remember your number, all of those things. But what you might see during that time is an increase in your pay-per-click calls. That's a direct reflection of your branding campaign working pretty well with radio, or you might see a spike in your Google Analytics that more people are going to your website. So they all work hand in hand. But you have to decide, first of all, what's your budget? What are your goals? And then prioritize that way. But the first step is always what's working and what's not. Fact versus speculation. Did that make sense? That did make sense, actually. Um, So in regards to like, instead of building, like, what is this ideal persona for every market? Instead of doing some, like you start your foundation, which I think is a good one, is really just going in and seeing, okay, what's working and what's not. Direct mail has a great return rate. Let's keep doing that. And then as you tweak, as you test, figuring out from the data, where are the channels that people are coming from? What's the most effective? So I think that's great. You can save a lot of money and cut out a lot of things that aren't working. And then knowing that your branding is always going to affect other parts of your business. It should increase. You should see an increase in your website traffic and all of that. It all should work together. But 
you really want to have a clear picture. And what I find, you know, over the 20 years of doing this is the majority of businesses, I shouldn't say the majority, a lot of businesses have no idea what's working and what, what's not working and what is working. And that's the first part of it. I agree. Very cool. I like it. I also you know, just love talking about their marketers. Yeah. And I did want to say, because I, th- I thought a lot about this as, as far as advice, because I think right now everyone's pretty fat and happy in the fact that we've had this amazing year, right? With COVID and not amazing year. We haven't personally, but <laughs> the trades people have, they've been busy, central workers. And what can happen during those times is that we can kind of get lazy on our approach to marketing and lazy about our business. And what I would say is recession proofing your business starts today. Meaning think about if things weren't this busy right now, are you showing up? Well, is your website converting? Are your reviews really good right now? And if they're not right now is the time to make these tweaks, not when things go South, don't be reactionary in your business marketing do it now, do it now while you're still getting the leads and things are really busy because things can turn. And what I find is when you're in that reactionary state, that's when people lose their businesses. That's when people don't make it out of those times. Whereas the people that are focusing on that, the business owners all throughout the year, those are the ones that thrive. They thrive because they know that there's a smaller pool of people going to look for a plumber when times in a recession time And if they're there, they're going to be a piece of that pool. But if they're nowhere to be found, they're not going to get the lead. That's great advice. I think everyone can heed that advice. It's always about thinking about, I mean, there's, there's, it's interesting. You want to be present and you want to, as a person, you want to be present, but as a business owner, you want to be thinking, you know, 10 steps ahead and figuring that stuff out. But it's true. Like if there is, if you're resting on your laurel, not resting on your laurels, but if you're in a good place right now, now is the time to beef up your reviews. Now is the time to beef up your website and see what has to be tweaked and make those changes. A question just came to me. Have you ever run a email campaign prompting folks to leave reviews? I have not done that yet. I more, you know what I do? I, I actually include the reviews in there for reputation. So I show like, especially on like the unsold estimates one, cause I want them to see that we're a reputable company. You know, you're really not supposed to solicit reviews on Google, my business and Yelp and all those. But I think certainly thanking somebody for being a customer and asking them if they had a great experience to write a review would be great. And I, and I will implement that, Jackie. Thank you. I haven't done that yet. <laughs> no worries. Geeking out on email marketing campaigns. All right. Let's yeah. talk about, let's talk about Desk Free Nation. What is it? Yeah. Tell me about it. So Desk Free Nation is, um, it's a nonprofit that I founded a couple of years ago and our whole mission, it, we have a couple of missions, but our mission is to get the stigma out of the trades. So get the stigma of young people entering the trades. You know, they, a lot of people perceive the trades as like being this place for uneducated people that didn't make it and couldn't go to college. And I really want to change that because the trades are awesome careers and they're extremely lucrative. And then another thing is really implementing storytelling through the trades of successful women and young men that have been in the trades and building out some ride and decide programs throughout the nation. So we have, I mean, it's a huge undertaking, but I'm pretty passionate about it. It's the trades need new blood and we're not doing it. We took away everything in high schools. You know, there's no shop classes and metal classes and there's really no exposure. So we want to educate influencers like school counselors and parents and young people on, on this awesome career opportunity for, for young people. I absolutely love that. And, um, I spoke, uh, we'll have this, the later on in this season, we'll hear from Keith Mercurio who just joined service Titan and he was at next star for years. And he said, we also need to make sure that we tell that if you become a plumbing technician an HVAC technician, you don't you also have to make clear what the trajectory is for that, what that door opens for you, which it sounds like you're also doing. So I would love to hear if you just have one, maybe some favorite stories of folks that you've helped within free destination so far, if there's any one or two stories that really warm your heart. Yeah. So we 
took the approach prior to the pandemic of really attacking this on a national level to start. And then what we found is it's too big of an, it's such a big issue that we actually are going locally. We're starting locally in Colorado now, and we're building out our systems right now. So we can then take this state by state and where I really want to, there's a couple of things. And you and I talked about this on the phone. Um, so very specifically right now, we are um, building out a ride and decide program throughout Colorado. So what that would mean is the school counselors interested in, they have a kid that might be interested in the trades and we, and we have to educate the school counselors on the trades because a lot of them don't even know where to, let's say you have a kid that's mechanically inclined. We, they don't even know what to do with that kid, you know? So we're building, we're fostering all of these relationships right now on a local level so that when there's a school counselor or a parent that has a child, a kid that's interested, mechanically inclined, man or woman, that we can give them a clear path on how to find out about companies that are, you know, that offer training, that offer apprentice programs, ride and decide programs. So we're partnering schools and companies together first. And then also aligning with tech schools as well. So this isn't limited to just young people. This could be people that, especially this year, there's a lot of people changing their careers completely. And they need to know about the trades and they need to know the opportunities that exist in the trades. But then there's this whole other issue. And I know I'm not answering your question specifically yet, but there's this whole other issue of, well, how do you do it? How do you become a plumber? If you're in Michigan, how do you become an electrician? That is very confusing information out there. So we want to make sure that these kids and we're partnering up with companies right now so we can show them exactly how to pursue those careers. This isn't my story, but there's um, a kid in Vail, Colorado. Vail is a very, very affluent area. And there's an XR member that has a shop up there. And he has a young tech that works for him um, that went to college, came back, came back to Vail, couldn't get a job. So Jim, the owner was like, well, I'm, I'm going to give you a shot, you know? And I guess he didn't even know how to run like a saw saw to start. And so here's this kid. He went to college, couldn't get a job. It starts working for a plumbing company up in Vail, Colorado and loves it. Not only does this kid love it, but his friends are envious of him. He's making a ton of money. And those are the kids. Those are the young people that we need to put up on posters and billboards and say, look at Sam. Look at, this is a kid that went to college, couldn't get a job. Now he's in the trades. He's making great money. He's had tremendous success. He loves it. He has job joy. Those are the stories we have to get out. Not the stories of the stigma um, or the perceived stigma, I should say. Yeah. I love that so much. And that's why I'm so happy we got a chance to talk about free destination because it really aligns lovely with what I'm trying to do with this podcast too, which is, oh, did you think one thing about the trades? Well, think again, because I've had, I think you'll be episode, I'm on episode 40 that's going live next week, not to date this episode, but I've spoken to now dozens of owners who run multi-million dollar shops. These are successful service entrepreneurs that make very good money. And the ones that are doing it really well, their techs, their teams are making really good money and they're helping keep their community safe and comfortable while while they do it. Like it's a really tremendous opportunity. And I'm so happy to hear that Desk Free Nation is doing this. The Ride and Decide program, I love. I just, my heart breaks for all of these kids who aren't (sighs) test takers. And it was actually Tom Howard uh, who works at Service Titan who told me that uh, there's a stat and I'm I'll just saying this with the caveat that I'm repeating something that someone told me, so it could be incorrect, <laughs> but that most business owners are dyslexic and just kind of the personality type that comes with business ownership maybe isn't suited for what our schools have turned out to be. So I just absolutely love that you're doing this. If folks are interested in learning more about Desk Free Nation or raising their hands to be a shop or a school to yeah. get involved, where can they do that? Well, I'm actually looking for, um, we're starting a recruiting podcast where we just want to give tips on recruiting and changing culture and really changing your shop to have women in there. So anybody has, feels like they're great on culture right now, or, you know, great on adapting to women in their, on their team or anything like that. We'd love 
we'd love anyone to get involved. And then of course, we'll be coming to your state soon. So um, we're lean and mean, and we are, we're on a mission to really change this. It, it needs to change. And um, we're really passionate about it. That's awesome. All right. Yeah. Very cool. So, um, yeah, bestfreenation.org is our website. And um, Megan at bestfreenation.org is, is my email. And then, um, but on the website, there's, there's plenty of information on there to get a hold of us. Excellent. Yes. And I will include that in the website for this or, or the, the page for this and in the show notes. No problem. All right. So I have a couple questions to wrap up, but um, the, my, my most recent favorite question in asking people is I want to know what are some of your favorite go-to books and podcasts? Oh, so early in my career, I would say like I read every business book and got totally wrapped up in that. But now I've evolved, I think as a human more and I'm really into just like success stories and the wisdom of people and what they've learned. And so like the school of greatness, which is, um, Lewis Howe, I don't know if you ever listened to him, but I love his stories. I love his interviews. I love super soul Sunday. I love anything that makes me feel good and lifts me up and just makes me go after my day. So I, and then of course I love finances. So I love like the Stanbury research and um, I love learning about new things in the financial industry and, and businesses. So, but that Lewis house, the school of greatness, he interviews all different types of business people and spiritual people. And I love it. Great. Awesome recommendation. All right. I have a couple rapid fire questions that I didn't give to you ahead of time. Are you ready? I'm ready. How do you take your coffee? Well, that's evolved too over time. I have a frother. And, um, so I, I take, uh, I have a Jura and I hit the button, get my coffee and then a frothy bunch of oat milk in there. Oh, I love it. I love an oat milk latte. Um, yeah. I've evolved too. I've stopped drinking, drinking coffee during the pandemic. And now when I do drink coffee, I'm like a superhero. Uh, so oh, if you ever wow. want to like, Good on you, girl. I, um, I used to, I used to do cream and maple syrup though. It was my go-to thing. And now the oat milk. Oat milk's great. I love it. If you could have dinner with one person dead or alive, who would it be? Oh, wow. Okay. I've heard this question before and I would say there's so many interesting people out there. There's so many interesting stories and so many, I would say Maya Angelou. That's who I would have. Yeah. And my daughter um, named after her, but I just think, um, she came from such hardship and I, I love, you know, it's, it's a person of persevering and not taking like that, your circumstance of in life and making it as excuse for how you live your life. And those are the kind of people like the gritty, resilient people are who inspire me the most. I love that. Um, what's the number one thing you're trying to learn more about now? play my guitar. I have, <laughs> I know this is rapid fire. I need you to know that I have officially, I have closed the book. It's been 16 years of me trying to play the guitar <laughs> and I've just accepted that I am not a guitar player. So good on I you. Him up yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If money weren't an object, so you had unlimited resources, what would you do? I would still help the trades for sure. I would probably, I would take my kids out of school and I would go live somewhere else and educate them in like a, in, in a free way where we kind of learn about culture and life. And then I'd also help the, I'd still work on the Desperate Nation for sure. Nice. What's the number one thing every contractor must do to run a successful business? Tap into what your customers want understand your customers. It's, it's not about you and what you're offering. It's about what your customers need and then providing a solution for those customers. Love it. Megan Bedford. Thank you for being on toolbox for the trades. Thanks for having me, Jackie. Ever wonder how the experts at Roto-Rooter, A1 Garage Door and Zoom Drain successfully scaled their business? Well, now's your chance to find out. Service Titan is proud to present the growth series, a free eight-week masterclass featuring some of the most successful service entrepreneurs. Hear directly from industry leaders on the strategies they use to achieve exceptional growth. The growth series kicks off Thursday, March 25th. 
with a talk from four-star General Stanley McChrystal, former commander of U.S. and international forces in Afghanistan and best-selling author. Don't miss this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Go to servicetitan.com slash growth to register for free. That's servicetitan.com slash growth.